Hey, this is Pamela Riemann Schneider. I'm the retail editor for Blue Book Services, and this is the Produce Reporter Week in Review. Greg, TikTok is important. <laughs> well, to some people in my house. So some people. Um, I, there was a, a a funny press release that we got this week um, that told me a restaurant that I heretofore did not know offered salads is now offering salads, and it's because of a TikToker. The salad looked it. pretty good. I saw I saw the pictures of it. Um, it is a California, mostly California chain. It's uh, El Pollo Lo Loco. And uh, yeah, they partnered with a TikToker. And it does get to some of the things that I've been hearing when I go to conferences and talking about new ways of engaging with consumers. And it's one of the best ways is to organically engage in places like TikTok. Find people who are popular, who just happen to mention or be adjacent to your product, and then form a relationship by starting off commenting and participating in mentions. And then it can lead to something like this, where there's a, a formal partnership where Yuri Lamas Bella of 4.3 million followers on TikTok is promoting their salads. I think that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I didn't even know this gal's name. I knew her content because I, 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 and I don't even watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians. That's what she's famous for. She's famous for parodying that show. And in that parody, she shakes a salad in the salad box, mocking how they shake their food. And she's got like post-its stuck to her fingernails as, as light and the fingernails. It, it's, it's, it's a whole thing and you wouldn't understand it unless you watch it. But I thought it was really interesting that this this restaurant is introducing the fact that they've got these chopped salads using someone they got famous for shaking a fake salad. Like it, it is absurd. It is so absurd, but it makes so much sense in the whole the whole world of TikTok that this would something like this would be relevant um, because I I'm on there. Right. Well, uh, produce with Pamela. Um, I mostly talk about fresh produce stuff. Um, I repost things that I see, like how rhubarb grows and stuff that I find interesting. I follow a lot of content from brands and we got to be really careful that our TikTok channels are not one big, long, boring commercial, right? So we have to find a way to engage people um, that, it, I mean, we point to people like Shay Myers and Caitlin Thornton as TikTokers who have a pretty wide audience based on their sharing their knowledge of the industry. Um, you know, Caitlin's riding around in her truck in the in the apple orchards and pear orchards. Shay's out there talking about the struggles of agriculture, really. Um, so those are more personal and more, uh, like you said, organic. Um, there's also a gal that does Cali organic. I saw one the other day and I don't, I don't want to get him in trouble, but there's a strawberry picker who um, has live videos of him picking strawberries. Um, and I guess people uh, watch him pick strawberries and pack them into the clamshells. Uh, somebody's going to find out about that. I'm not going to say who he picks them for. <laughs> but I come up on his feet every once in a while and watch him watch him pack strawberries in the field. And I don't know if his um, corporate overlord knows he's doing it. But I find it interesting. And I think a lot of people find some of this stuff like it, it's demystifying agriculture. It's demystifying what we do and also making it engaging and entertaining. So when you see a brand adopt someone like this and make a deal with someone, it's always really exciting. I, I mean, I really feel like this year's Olympics coverage was made dynamic by the engagement and content from TikTok. Um, a lot of people would not know how awesome the women's rugby team was without Ilona Meyer out there uh, TikToking um, through the village and all this other stuff. And the guy with the muffins, um, the Norwegian swimmer who was in love with the muffins at the, I saw a different TikTok about somebody had gotten the recipe for how to make those chocolate muffins. Um, so there's all this crazy stuff that's happening and it really makes for a dynamic experience as long as it's interesting and not just a commercial. Yeah, I think that's the key. From from what I've observed of my household members using TikTok, you must, number one, entertain them. And number two, if you get some education in there, that's a bonus. 
That's a bonus. And as long as it's not linking out to my TikTok shop about, you know, brands of pants and whatever, that's the other part that's getting a little tedious is that this is a raging vacuum of content and we have to, they have to find more and more and more original content that is entertaining, like you said, and not just trying to sell me something. Um, they, they have to walk a fine line um, uh, doing that. So, yeah. I agree. Well, back to the real world of merger and acquisition season. It seems like every other week we've been talking about Grub Market or Fresh Edge acquiring somebody, but three different pretty big acquisitions this week hit the news and didn't involve either, either of those. For yeah. A for a change, we had Performance Food Group. Um, we had South Little Champs, I think, is a sleeper. Uh, when people are, uh, they've made some major acquisitions um lately not not just uh they bought a tampa based distributor so they're they're expanding their distribution all over the continent really um and then what was the other one i forgot that one it was oh i was going to point out if there's on the uh south mill champs acquisition one um there's a map at the bottom that you can click to expand that gives you a good idea of where they have operations and you can see that it's much bigger than just a mushroom company they are they're doing some dynamic things the other one is legacy food group uh added halsey produce to their list of divisions so that's it's a significant pickup for them i'd say i mean they're the the space that they're competing in is doing a lot of mergers and acquisitions and growing and i think that's that's if, if you're if you're going to compete with the big boys, I think that has to be the way one of the one of the ways. Well, and just to you know, we we notice a lot of merger and acquisitions because we see a lot of it when we're doing our our news sweep for the morning. And then we, but um, if you want to keep up on some of these things, just to just to give you a little clue, a key, um, when you go into the produce reporter newsletter, um, those little headers that say. Um, now connected, for example, that's our people items or industry analysis. Um, the merger and acquisition one, you just click on that and it'll take you to all the recent mergers and acquisitions. Um, so you can see um, the trends and how often we're seeing mergers and acquisitions. And we just noticed that there was a bump recently. So uh, that was that was kind of interesting. We wanted to know. And we'll, of course, link out to all of those, uh, make sure that you can find them. Um, but then we also saw something this week that was um a bump a surge possibly uh that made me really really wonder like what are people thinking um and and i had to i had to throw in my piece about it have you ever noticed a um uh electronic shelf lab label at the gro at the grocery store um uh, the, yeah typically the, the places i shop don't use those Right, but they do, and that's the funny thing. Um, so if you've not encountered a dynamic price label, um, it's an electronic thing. They've replaced the paper ones that fit in the little channel. Um, I've seen them at retailers from Whole Foods is the first store that I started to notice notice them at, and then um, when my husband and I were in France at grocery stores in 2020, um, in January of 2020, um, the I saw like a, the smallest farmer's market type place. It, it, it didn't even look fancy. It was not a fancy grocery store. Um, almost every co-op that you go to in Switzerland, and I'm sure that means that a lot of the other co-ops, since it's such a big retailer, um, uh, Carrefour, uh, Hy-Vee, <laughs> Schnucks. So this is not just a fancy grocery store thing. Um, but I, what was what's hitting this news this week is that uh, two senators, uh, Democrats, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and then the senator from Pennsylvania, can't Bob remember Casey. his name, Bob Casey, um, wrote a letter, kind of, kind of, saying that Kroger's implementing these dynamic pricing labels to do grocery surge pricing, and I feel like. While that is possible, that's so wildly out of left field um, for what's going on with a lot of those labels because everything that the grocery industry 
thinks of them. And I'm sure there's some guy out there going, hey, but you know, we could do surge pricing with these. And they're probably like, dude, stop. <laughs> right. Because, you know, that's a terrible. That's not going to work long term once consumers figure that out. No, because then they're going to be like, hey, guess what? Kroger surges its prices between 5 and 7 p.m. or 5 and 6 p.m. If you're, you know, stopping on the way home from work, uh, you're going to pay more for your groceries. That's kind of absurd. Although you do see some dynamic pricing when you shop online, for example, for groceries. Um, but in store, those tags are the, the biggest function of those tags and has always been to reduce labor hours um, because it takes, I, I saw one estimate anywhere from one to two minutes to change each one of those tags and a grocer can go through and change minimum 500 of those tags per week when they're changing their, you know, the Wednesday ad drops, you got to go and change all those price tags. Somebody has to change them. <laughs> you know? yeah, and if you there's, think there's a labor problem, there's a huge labor problem. That is one of the biggest things for them is to, is to do labor savings. And then I've even watched presentations talking about food waste and um, they can use those tags to do price drops on something that has been there for a while. Um, and as we evolve past UPC codes, which have limited information on them, when we can start putting uh, best by date codes in uh, some of the packaging, then you can drop the drop the price based on the the date of that. I've seen I've seen that in, implemented in Europe. I believe Anna Marie pointed to it in one of her presentations not too long ago. Um, it, so there are a whole lot of different things that you can do with a dynamic price tag, and I I thought it was really interesting that. This letter from the senators is just pointing toward Kroger. Meanwhile, I mean, all these other retailers, Whole Foods, chain wide, I believe, and has had them chain wide since at least 2018. Yeah. Um, Walmart just announced that they're adding them to 2,300 stores. Uh, and, uh, there, it's not just a Kroger thing, but they did point out that Kroger does do a tremendous amount of um, data mining um customer data uh, they know a lot about their customers and they can get really granular on and what they're their not customers the only are. ones yeah they're not the only ones but they do have that whole entire division the 8531 or 8551 um the the customer yeah, data division. one of one of the lessons i think is anytime there is a major issue and we have a major issue with food inflation inflation in general, but food inflation. And so the politicians see this and then they try to gain political favor by picking a, a target that they think will work. So they pick Kroger, who's involved in this FTC merger, seemingly a, a, an easy target. Meanwhile, many industries do this, much less in the grocery industry, but and. <laughs> The irony of it is much of our inflation problems is because of government policy. So the two senators, like, dudes, like, we know you're a bigger part of the problem than Kroger. Well, it's not <laughs> just that. I You have to admit, when consumers are trying to connect the dots on their own, when they see a lot of the grocery profits statements and, and and you know quarterly reports and it's not just record sales it's record profits on some of them um there is some i i believe warranted looking into some of the pricing that they've got at grocery is it taking advantage of people's you know inability to go elsewhere for food um, well, that's, that, that is a big part of it because as we cover in the inflation monthly report Grocery, well, basically, they, they categorize that food at home is not right. rising as quickly as food away from home, which is restaurants. And we've talked plenty about some of the struggles in the restaurant industry. And you know, grocery stores are, are doing quarterly reports where they're showing strong sales and profits. And meanwhile, it seems like every other week we see another restaurant chain filing Chapter 11. So that's the reality. And the consumer reality is everything's more expensive, but it's more expensive at restaurants and grocery stores. And no one ever stops eating. So they are turning to grocery more. Uh, I'm not, you know, it's, 
is, is grocery to blame for that? I don't necessarily think grocery is to blame for it, but I think the there are situations where things like shrinkflation are getting a little egregious. And we've always cautioned about shrinkflation. Like you have to explain that you're doing this and not just pull a fast one on people and introduce a smaller packaging size. We have to talk about what it can do for you. Hey, you're not buying as much, but if you're paying the same amount, the, the one that's that gets me every time I buy it is uh, the chocolate milk at Costco went from a full half gallon to not quite a half gallon and it's $3 more now and it's ridiculous. It's outrageous. Like, I know that I know that it does not cost this much more <laughs> and they're just scamming me. So I quit buying it. So that's what consumers have to do is they have to quit buying. It reminds me, this whole discussion reminds me of back in February at, during the quarterly report, Wendy's talked about spending like $20 million or something like that. Um, don't quote me on that number. I just pulled that out of my head on new menu boards that were digital and it allowed them to switch their menu boards based on daytime, like day part, right? Like we're the breakfast board now and then you switch to lunch and and that's when the Egg McMuffin goes away, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then they mentioned something about dynamic pricing on those and somebody in who, who paid attention to that call got on social media and said surge pricing. They said, Wendy's is gonna start doing surge pricing on their menu and then the internet went insane Enough that Wendy's had to get out there and say, no, absolutely not. Can you think of any fast food restaurant right now that is thinking about price gouging? All of them are desperate to get people in and they're all lowering their prices. Yeah, McDonald's <laughs> expended, extended their five their limited time $5 menu items or meal plan or whatever it was. Uh, they extended it. Their franchisees lobbied corporate uh, McDonald's to extend it because it did lead to increased traffic. And that's, that's what they're going for. And they are, they are hurting dynamic pricing goes both ways. Right. And, I mean, in, in, in professional sports, uh, a lot of sports teams do dynamic, dynamic pricing, especially like baseball, for instance, prices for the exact same seat will cost more for a Friday night, summer game than a Tuesday night, April game. That's dynamic pricing. Are they gouging you know what else? Friday night in the summer? I don't know. I mean, what's the baseline? It they're it costs more to go to a high value game and it costs less to go to a low value game. Well, they do the same thing too, is if you follow the dynamic pricing and you wait until day of to get a ticket, sometimes you can find really cheap tickets, especially for concerts when people start when to get desperate. Sell out. Yes. <laughs> When yeah. they sell out, you're you're going on a stub hub and paying the markup. <laughs> it goes both ways. Right. <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting that this letter just reads like, you know, we got snidely whiplash out there twirling his mustache and and talking about charging people. But I can I cannot even imagine what it, a retailer would do to shoot itself in the foot by doing surge pricing based on demand at the store that uh, that is when you want to let it fly right that's that whole you know when stuff is flying off the shelves they love it and they will loss leader and they will lower prices in order to get stuff to fly so i would see that as something that's more likely to happen with this variable pricing and then when it goes back to normal oh man you missed the sale that's our everyday normal low price um, and then you got to watch these these tags or these sales or our social media. Um, and that's when you get to take advantage of some of those things. So I, I just thought it was a little interesting that people <laughs> got a little crazy about this. Um, and then they just, I, you know, I do the same thing when I criticize retailers. I pick the biggest retailers and point out things that they are doing that maybe aren't for the, the good of the consumer. Um, and Walmart and Kroger are both. Uh, retailers that I regularly point towards. So makes sense. All right. Well, that, nope, oh, sorry. Go ahead. You see where, you see where they're coming from? <laughs> I can't see where they're coming from. Picking them, picking on the biggest retailers. Um, I do the same thing. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for the Produce Reporter Week in Review. If you are not getting the Produce Reporter newsletter, you need to go to producebluebook.com and sign up. 